So welcome uh, uh, this evening to our evening reflection here at Merlin Rice Church. Uh, and um, before we start, let's just have a word of prayer as we approach God's word. So Heavenly Father, we ask this evening that um, as your Holy Spirit uh, uh, inspired your servants of old and taught them things uh, about times in the future, we pray that as we read and we reflect tonight, that same spirit will speak to us and help us to understand the world we live in and the times that we live in as well. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're continuing this evening in our series on the book of Daniel. And uh, if you've been following that series, you may have realised that we've kind of reached a turning point in the book. We've read the first six chapters and this evening we're coming on to chapter seven. Now, when you think of the book of Daniel, those first six chapters are generally what you think about. Riveting stories, big on drama and courage and daring do, dramatic turnarounds and last minute reprieves, the burning fiery furnace, the lion's den and mysterious hands writing on walls. But now that's all over. The furnace has called, the lions have roared, and the writing's been written. And now the scene switches from the big stage to, well, if you will, bedtime. Uh, and uh, it switches from life and death challenges to dreams and visions and prophecies. It's a bit like going from Biggles, if you're of a certain age, you might remember him, to James Joyce or Virginia Woolf. Because Daniel was not only a hero of faith, he was also a prophet. And the difference here might seem very stark. It's a very abrupt change. But there is a link, a very definite link, between the message of all that drama that's gone before and the message of these prophecies. And it's a link which also has something to tell us in our own day. It has something to say to the church in the 21st century. It's worth noting, however, that these prophecies we're about to read are not actually a sequel to the drama. It's not as if Daniel is retiring to his bed, tired out after all that strenuous action. The vision that we're going to look at this evening actually falls in the middle of that action, during the reign or the regency of Belshazzar, the ruler who was living it up with a huge feast when upon the wall appeared the mysterious writing predicting his downfall. And you may indeed recall that that very night his kingdom fell to the invading armies of Persia. Events, both that giant knees up and the following capitulation, which secular historians also confirm. So if you were to put this vision into time order, it wouldn't fit after chapter six as it comes here, but between chapters four and five in the middle of all the action. So let's have a look at this vision. This is Daniel chapter seven, starting at verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. And he wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second bear, beast, which also looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. And after that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. 
While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch, because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. <clears throat> I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. And so he told me, gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, and also I wanted to know about the ten horns on its head. Verse 23, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, and after them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints, and try to change the set times and the laws and the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So, at the beginning of Daniel's vision, he sees a sea in turmoil. The waves whipped up by fierce winds, albeit, as we read, under control of heaven, under control of God. These winds are thought to represent human affairs in a state of chaos, such as invariably accompanies the rise and fall of great kingdoms. Because this vision is about kingdoms, it's a glimpse of kingdoms and empires to come. Daniel sees four mighty beasts in turn. A winged lion, a ravenous bear, a four-headed leopard. Pretty scary stuff when in your dream you're in the middle of all this. I remember being pretty terrified, even as an adult, by that three-headed dog, Fluffy, in Harry Potter. If I'd had this dream, I would have been screaming. And then, fourthly, a monster with iron teeth, crushing and devouring all in its path. And Daniel's told that these beasts represent four kingdoms, four empires. Now, it's pretty clear that the lion is the kingdom of Babylon itself, the kingdom in power as Daniel dreams his dream, the invading power which has crushed Jerusalem and transported Daniel along with thousands of others to where he is now. The symbol of Babylon was indeed a lion, often depicted 
with wings. You can see those lions for yourself. You don't have to go all the way to Iraq, the site of ancient Babylon, to do it. You'll find them in the British Museum. And if you fancy a weekend break or a, a Christmas market, how about a quick trip to Berlin, where in the Pergamon Museum, a remarkable museum, you'll find a life-size reproduction of the Gate of Ancient Babylon, built by Nebuchadnezzar himself, the Nebuchadnezzar of the Book of Daniel, and complete with winged lions. So the lion is almost certainly Babylon. But we are here in the last days of this great empire, and it won't be long before it's devoured by the ravenous bear, the next kingdom, which is therefore Persia. The very subject, of course, of that writing on the wall that we just mentioned. After the bear, after Persia, comes the leopard, also with wings, a symbol of speed, and seen as pointing to the incredible speed with which the Greek empire spread propelled by the exploits of Alexander the Great, whose armies swept across the deserts of Asia and who conquered huge swathes of the ancient world before he was 30, which makes the fourth beast, the biggest, the most terrifying, the Roman Empire. The large iron teeth, crushing and devouring, can be compared with Rome's irresistible and ruthlessly efficient armies. The whole culture of ancient Rome was a warlike one, where glory and riches were to be had by mowing down Rome's enemies. Uh, and those enemies, given Rome's thirst for dominion and power, amounted to pretty much anyone else you care to think of at that time. Daniel is told that this kingdom, the fourth kingdom, will devour the whole earth. And if you lived in those days, you would have said it pretty much did reaching the parts that other empires could not reach, stretching west to Spain, at the other end of the Mediterranean, south to the coast of Africa, and north to the freezing forests of Germany, and indeed, even north by northwest, planting its feet on England's clouded hills and mountains green, and ruling for the best part of half a millennium. So the picture fits and Rome it would appear to be, that fourth empire. Now, if you've been following the Daniel series, this may start to ring a bell, because the interpretation of this vision relating to these four great empires is the same prediction as the one which arises from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which Daniel interprets right back in chapter two. Different imagery, different pictures, but the same four empires. So these different visions do point in a common direction. Now, why all the fuss about these four empires, you may ask? Well, well, living as they were, unknowingly to most, in the last days of one empire, it makes sense to ask the question, doesn't it? What follows? And these were the four great empires of their world, the ancient world, spanning between them well over a thousand years of history. So up to here, the two prophecies, Nebuchadnezzar's dream at the beginning and Daniel's vision here, are aligned together. But from this point, they differ in focus. The first, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, takes us to the coming of Jesus, which it foretells remarkably. The second, Daniel's vision here, takes us to the latter days of human history. The fourth beast, Rome, we imagine, is, we're told, different from the others, in that it has 10 horns. Uh, and then comes another little horn, uprooting three of those 10, speaking boastful words, causing chaos, and then facing judgment. As the Ancient of Days, God himself, takes his seat on the eternal throne, surrounded by a cast of thousands upon thousands. And then there is one like the Son of Man, coming on the clouds, who is given all power and authority, a phrase, of course, which is echoed in Jesus' own words, and whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. We're looking at the second coming, we're looking at the return of Christ in all his glory. Nevertheless, the interpretation makes it very clear that that boastful horn, a king or a kingdom or a power of some sort, will for a time wreak havoc he will speak against the Most High and will persecute the people of God 
who will be handed over to him for a time, and he will seem for a while to be succeeding before finally his power is taken away and the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. And we're assured once again at the end of that interpretation that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Now, we are here in the same context as much of the book of Revelation, which we've been studying on Sunday mornings. And as we've been going through that series, I do recall that a couple of weeks ago, Mark was pointing out, I believe wisely, that particularly when you look at apocalyptic visions like this one, it can be more helpful to stand back and look at the big picture, rather than try to unravel the small detail, which can be very complex, and rather than try and take wild guesses at what individual things might mean. If you like, it's a bit like an impressionist painting. You've got to stand back to see the picture properly. And when you do, it's beautiful. Move closer, look at the individual brush strokes, and it's less clear, it's a bit disorientating even. And this is the principle that we sometimes have to use in passages like these. Stand back and look at the big picture. Now you see, the 10 horns of Daniel chapter seven have been poured over by theologians for centuries. So I don't want to disappoint you, but I am unlikely to outwit all of those wise men in the next five minutes. Neither the empires of Rome nor Greece appear to have spawned 10 kingdoms exactly. And indeed, had they done so, it would seem to have been a bit early because this is clearly an end of days vision. Some people relatively recently have been tempted to identify the 10 horns with the European Union, which once looked like it might consist of 10 nations. Well, even for an enthusiastic Brexiteer, that's pretty heavy stuff. And of course, as you know, I'm not one of those. Uh, but now, with the benefit of hindsight, it would be a long journey to get back to 10 nations. It would need not just a Brexit, or even a Grexit, a Polexit, maybe a Chexit, or even a Frexit, and you still wouldn't be close. Now, this comes, of course, with a caveat. I'm not a prophet. Uh, I don't foretell the future. I can be wrong. But right now, that looks a lot less likely than it may have looked uh, some decades ago. It's perhaps natural that every generation tends to magnify the issues and the events of our own time with the wider sweep of history behind it. It's not surprising because what we live with every day is what we think about. But over time, these things can look a bit less accurate. However, the point here is this. The big picture is very, very clear. It's the big picture of this vision and those that follow that is the big picture and the main message, both of the dramatic stories that we read in the first half of the book and of these visions. It's the big picture of the book of Daniel as a whole. Because here, as we said at the start, the stories and the visions are linking up to tell us the same thing. I might say the same two things that, that, that make up the big picture of this book, the big message of this book. So firstly, the first big thing, God is in control of the great course of history. Even when, from a particular vantage point, it might be hard to see. The Jewish people of old, Daniel's contemporaries, were looking from such a vantage point. Israel was the promised land, and Jerusalem was its jewel, the house of God, the hilltop crown of David's mighty kingdom, beautified by his son Solomon. And then against all odds, and by nothing short of a miracle, Jerusalem survived the attack of the awesome, all-conquering army of Assyria. So what could shake its sure repose? But now, shaken it was, and in ruins and rubble it lay. So where was God? Even his temple had gone. So was God really in control? That was the perspective of the first readers of these words. And the message is, yes, God was in control. His prophets had actually foretold this very day. And in these stories, as Daniel and his friends stand up for their faith, and they get to influence and move the hands that move the fate of empires, it becomes clear 
that it's not emperors and kings who are really in control, but the king of kings and the lord of lords. Even Nebuchadnezzar, one of the mightiest kings of history, confirms it in his own words. Surely, he says to Daniel, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. And now, as this vision of Daniel's stretches our view beyond the events of the moments and away towards the end of days, the truth is the same. It is God who controls the greatest of empires, God who reigns over human history, God who unfolds the scroll of the centuries and who is, in the words of one of our hymns, the potentate of time. So even when your vantage point obscures your view, this truth remains the same and you can rest assured. Secondly, the second big thing and related to it, that great sweep of history will include times and seasons when the people of God might seem to be on the back foot when the events and the people of their day will seem to be turning against them. Such was the plight of those for whom these stories were first told, bullied by a bigger army, crushed by a pagan power, a migrant minority as they were then, surrounded by a triumphant culture. And the message to them was, yes, the unthinkable has happened, but God is still on the throne. It's a question of your vantage point. Now, Daniel's vision turns the clock forward to a much later time when the people of God will once again seem to be on the back foot, oppressed by, and like the Israel of old, even handed over to a hostile power, that boastful horn, which will eventually, of course, meet its judgment. Now, it's important to think too that this particular prophecy is not an isolated one. This is not just about one page of the Bible, one paragraph of scripture. It's repeated again and again as the Bible story moves forward. Jesus makes it very clear in his description of the end of the age, which you can read in Matthew's Gospel and also in Mark's. Jesus says, you will be handed over, you'll be persecuted, you may even be put to death, you'll be hated by all nations because of me. And so many will turn away from the faith and many will grow cold. In other words, Jesus is saying, there will be a time when the church may shrink. Now, this vision, which actually first is hinted at right back in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, it's repeated several times in the following chapters of Daniel's prophecies. Jesus here unfolds it in detail. It comes again several times in Paul's letters, particularly to the Thessalonians. And of course, it's there at great length in the book of Revelation. So this is not an isolated prophecy, it's a repeated Bible principle. So we've looked at what all this said to the people of its time, but what's it saying to us today? Well, firstly, it does say, once again, remember your vantage point. What you see in your own place and your own day is not the full picture. This was the big truth that the people of Israel in exile were being invited to grasp. And like them, we in our own society, in our own time, face a world which can seem to be quite discouraging. Sometimes events can seem to be putting us a bit on the back foot. The church at large does seem to be shrinking here in Britain and in Western Europe. And there are some who are very keen to predict its demise. And Daniel's vision says, if that surprises you, rest assured that's no surprise to God. God's got this. He's seen it coming for centuries and centuries since the beginning of time, so fear not. Furthermore, I do want to say, perhaps predictably, that I will beg to differ from the prophets of impending doom for the church. I know many churches of living faith in the surrounding area, area around here, which are healthy and growing. Uh, I tend to feel that it's the more nominal, uh, the more casual coat of Christianity which is mainly being shed. I read recently that someone in the Catholic Church had said that it was growing in six out of seven continents. Um, of course, uh, that may be a bit difficult to say for Antarctica, where there aren't too many people, but the worldwide picture, this is the point, the worldwide picture is one of growth and not shrinking. And what is true of the Catholic Church, I think, is true of the church at large. 
there has been exponential growth amongst the huge populations of the East and the Pacific Rim. Growth too in Africa, where at the turn of the last century, uh, there were less than 10% of Christians, and now more than 50%. Take a look at a world map. Africa is a very big place. Consider the growth too that we've seen in the countries of South America. And now let me read this to you, a poem called Dover Beach, just a couple of lines. The poet's on the beach looking at the tide coming in and going out. The sea of faith was once too at the full around Earth's shore, but now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar. The writer Matthew Arnold, the famous headmaster of rugby school. The date, 1851, 170 years ago exactly. Now, a lot of good things have happened in the worldwide church since 1851. Matthew Arnold would have been overjoyed by the stories of growth that I've just told you, invisible then to him, but visible to us. Remember, it's all a question of your vantage point. And so lastly, if nonetheless you look at some of the trends, particularly in the Western world, in our own country, and they make you wonder, as sometimes they do me, then remember too that what you might well be observing could be nothing less than Bible prophecy itself, nothing less than a repeated biblical principle starting to play itself out. A principle that comes again and again. And remember that that means that your Christian beliefs are all the more true and all the more believable, not less. And that the word of God traces the whole expanse of history and that the hand of God holds within it the whole of human affairs. So take heart and take courage. Not only does the body of the church continue to grow, but the head of the body, the God of gods and the Lord of kings, does indeed have the whole world in his hands. And if he has the whole world in his hands, he's certainly got you and I in his hands as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, spirit-given vision of your sovereignty, your greatness, and your kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom and which outlives and outweighs all the other kingdoms of the earth. Give us courage, we pray, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be, both in our daily life and in the society that we live in, that we may, in a constructive and positive way, be the kind of people that when others look at us, they will see something of you, something of your love and something of your grace. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.